Hi everyone. This week we are going to go over the uh, pre-globalized world. So we are going to go over a history of humanity pretty much in broad terms and how they came together and how consumption and production were organized until 1820. This course content is partly taken from SFU professor Nicolas Schmidt's notes. However, I am entirely responsible for any error and I do not allow this content to be published without my consent. So, in order to understand the world economy as it is today, we need to go back to how um, the first economies were built and um, why they were built this way. So, from the birth of civilization until the 1820s pretty much, trade only happens locally. So in this case, remember the narrative around dues and bundlings, consumption and production are bundled. Where things are made, they are consumed. So international trade can happen if consumption and production are unbundled, made here, sold there. Back then, there was no such thing as international. There was barely anything, any such thing as national. It was more of a local thing. So here, in this lecture, we are going to keep track of consumption and production using some historical faces and describing some uh, particular events that um, triggered the transition between one phase to another. So, this week we are going to, vo to go over two phases out of four. The first one is about humanizing the globe. This is the first chapter in Baldwin's book, The Great Convergence, if you want to have extra reading. Not mandatory, but always good to hear, always good to read. Where consumption moves to production. So typically, a um, group of people, usually hunters-gatherers, um, hunters um, would go from one place to another where there is food, where there is um, where there are animals and where there are fruits and other vegetables, other resources. So international trade is a very exotic phenomenon in particular because there is no such thing as tools to ship goods from one location to the other. In the second phase, from 12,000 um, before Christ until 1820. The agricultural revolution makes production move to consumption. My bad, there is a typo here. So international trade again is regular, but not very large. For the same reasons as before, shipping a good from one location to the other uh, is still a very expensive thing. Then next week, we are going to go over phase three, the rise of trade between 1820 and 1990, where things start to pick up pretty fast and start to get more interesting. That's going to be chapter two in Baldwin's book. This uh, phase started with the Industrial Revolution, the Steam Revolution, that allows to unbundle production and consumption. And it is what we will call the first unbundling. In phase four, after 1990, there will be a new phase triggered by the ICT revolution, information and communication technology. That is going to be the second unbundling. This is more uh, recent. It's probably the most interesting part. But in order to get there, we first need to understand phase one phase two and phase three. So, phase one. Phase one is just about the globalization of the human race. Humanity is made of hunter-gatherers. They hunt animals and eat them pretty much on the spot. They have no um, tools and no technology to keep meat any uh, longer than probably a couple days. So in this case, consumption goes to production. Humanity goes where there is enough food to live, 
once the resources are depleted, they move to another spot. Very primitive way to live, but at that time, tools were pretty rare. Um, humanity knew how to do fires, and that was pretty much it. And they probably had tools to build a couple of weapons here and there. Climate change provoked two migrations out of Africa. One a very long time ago, but remember those things are estimates. So this is not something I'm going to ask you to remember by heart. It's just to give you uh, an idea of what happened. And in 83,000 before Christ, there was a millennium long spike um, in a planet's average temperature that uh, allowed humanity to migrate. There is long distance trade already. An example is obsidian. It's a black um, volcanic glass. You can think about this as dragon glass in, in Game of Thrones, for instance. It pretty much looks like it. And it allowed humanity to build in particular weapons to hunt. But there are no such thing as pack animals. There are no uh, mules, donkeys, cows and other um, animals that they can use to carry big amount of resources on long distances. So this trade is very limited. Here is a map of the earliest, um, earliest population estimates. Not um, very relevant for um, the rest of the course, just to give you an idea of where the oldest populations are from. But again, those are estimated. And you can imagine that getting data from 200,000 years ago is going to be pretty complicated. So researchers use um, climate, weather, and whatever traces and bones they could find to try to trace back um, those populations. Phase two is more interesting. Starting in 12,000, 10,000 uh, before Christ until 200 before Christ came the rise of Asia. The stabilization of climate makes populations concentrate around long growing season region. Think about regions with monsoons, um, rather, um, rather wet regions where there can be floods and also around big rivers. Around 10,000 before Christ is the agricultural revolution. Animals get domesticated. And because of that, we can now locate production and consumption in fixed locations. Farming, exactly. We can start growing crops, and also we can start developing productivity, um, productivity techniques that allow populations to produce more than uh, just enough to feed themselves. That's going to be also a huge um, determinant during that phase. So we can fear more people that needed to produce the food. And so the rest can also focus on civilization services. Rules, maybe build defenses around, uh, around cities and so on. And so population will uh, grow, cities will develop. And this is pretty much at that time that we are witnessing the creation of civilizations. More than just hunter gatherers, um, local societies. The course will not be open book. Uh, if you're wondering about exams and things like that, everything will be closed book. One of the regions that was very um, successful, that was very um, in demand, that was a lot in demand by populations was the Fertile Crescent. Fun fact, Crescent is literally the same thing as Croissant, the French thingy. So I don't really understand why it's called Crescent when we say croissant for any, um, any of those things in any English-speaking country. Um, goats were domesticated, um, cattle, sheep, pigs. So they could be raised to um, carry crops, but also to be eaten. Barley and corn were grown um, in this area.
the Fertile Crescent is not the only region where there were agricultural innovations. You can find some um, in Asia as well. You can see here in India, some in Africa, especially around, well, around the ocean or around some big lakes slash rivers. And supposedly also in the Americas back then. Southeast Asia as well. So production moves to consumption and permanent villages develop. In particular, we can find valleys, the Yellow River Valley in Asia, the Indus Valley, Asia as well, uh, Middle East, which we are going to call uh, Asia for, um, for a while, until pretty much the 1820s, in Mesopotamia, and also around the Nile. And the, the Fertile Crescent was around here, I believe. In particular, the annual flooding solves the problem of soil exhaustion. So you can see that all of those uh, civilizations develop around places with big rivers, uh, yearly floods and um, pretty mild temperatures, pretty mild weathers where we have different growing seasons, you know, spring, um, summer, winter and fall. Or wet seasons versus dry seasons. Because of the food surplus, there was a huge rise in population. For a very long time, population was um, rather constant. But as populations could grow more than they need to feed themselves, population grew and also this uh, population growth was amplified by the use of tools. There was the Bronze Age, then the Iron Age, and you can see that around those periods, the um, populations increased populations increased dramatically. This whole phase can be decomposed into three stages. First of all, the rise of Asia. As I showed before, most of the valleys were located in the Middle East or in Asia. That's between minus 12,000 and minus 200. Then Eurasian integration between two, minus 200 and plus 1350. And we're going to see a series of events around 1350 that are going to trigger the third stage, which is the rise of Europe. So you can see some kind of progression here. First, Asia rises. Then Europe and Asia integrate. That's going to be the Silk Road with more, uh, more trade, even though we'll see it's still rare, but a bit of trade. And then a series of events around 1350 are going to trigger the rise of Europe. This will lead us to 1850, 1820, where the first unbundling is going to start. First, the rise of Asia. With the Bronze Age, cities and civilizations expand around river valleys. That's the map I showed previously. Here are a couple dates of uh, the main civilizations back then. Sumerian civilization, the Egyptians, uh, civilization around the Indus Valley, Chinese civilization, and a bit later, um, other civilizations among which we can find the Mesoamerican. Uh, disclaimer, I am not a big expert in the history of civilizations. When I was a kid, I believe I studied Egyptian civilization a bit and then Greeks, Romans, you know, I'm, Euro I'm European, so uh, they make us study European history. So you don't need to know those dates by heart, okay? It's not the point of the course. This lecture is about giving you a rough sketch of how things um, unfolded over time. We're going to get into the economics from next week on. For now, it's mostly going to be history of civilizations.
As I mentioned before, the Middle East is included in Asia here. So it's going to be part of the growth of those um, civilizations. Another, um, another measure of the dominance of Asia is to count the number of cities that have over 100,000 inhabitants. Of course, those are estimates based on um, any, um, any historical evidence, probably the use of tools, old ornaments, um, bones, and, um, yeah, and other settlements. And you can see that Middle East and China have the largest um, share of cities over 1,000, um, 100,000 inhabitants. Now, let's relate population to growth. Since there is no such thing as added value, because productivity is not really a thing yet, growth, GDP growth, I'll talk about GDP uh, in a moment, comes from population. So the larger the population, the larger the output, because you have more people to work. So the share of the world population will be very correlated to the share of world GDP. Pretty much this means that Middle East and China had the largest share of world GDP due to their high population. What is GDP? So for those of you who are just um, taking an econ course for the first time, GDP, gross domestic product, is the main measure of um, growth of income in a country. Note that I do not talk about wealth. I talk about income. Very different thing. So it is a monetary measure of the market value of all the final goods and services produced in a given region or country over a given period of time. If you want to look at how how much this value increased or decreased over time, you can compute the growth rate. A growth rate is always defined as the following. You take whatever measure at time t, this is the subscript t, let's say GDP at uh, in year 2020, minus GDP year t minus 1, that would be 2019, divided by the value yesterday previous period, GDP in 2019. So if I consider 2020 and 2019, I would say that in 2020, related as opposed to, well, as opposed, relative to 2019, GDP increased by this amount, GT. This is the growth rate of this monetary measure between 2020 and 2019. It is the measure we'll still use nowadays to uh, look at how healthy economies are. Typically, we could say, oh, if an economy is in a recession, then the growth rate is going to be negative. The market value of all the goods on one year was lower than the year before. If the economy is growing, then we would expect a high growth rate. I encourage you to look at uh, GDP growth rate, especially uh, once numbers are out about 2020 because of the pandemic, chances are most, um, most growth rates are going to be negative because of the pandemic. But it would be interesting to see which countries, which economies were the most affected. How big is one unit of time generally? It really depends on what, you're, um, on what you are interested in. So you could look at one year after the other, but there are also regular releases of um, quarterly measures. So you can also find um, quarterly, quarter, uh, quarterly growth rates. So from one quarter to another, so from the first three months of 2020 to the next three months of 2020, you could look at, you could look at uh, the growth rate. Especially in 2020, you probably will find that the growth rate is positive between January and March, because the pandemic was had not hit yet. I mean, 
it was more like end of February with lockdowns. But then from March to May, June, probably you would see a drop in the growth rates because so many businesses had to um, shut down temporarily. So GDP increased with population. The more people you have to work, the higher the market value of all the final goods because more is being produced. So automatically, a country with a lot of people, a lot of labor force, will have a high GDP. So as long as population increases, as long as the number of workers increases, then GDP will also increase as a consequence. However, because most of the, the growth is driven by population, once you divide GDP by the population, the number of inhabitants, then you will always end up with the same number, roughly. And this is what we call GDP per capita. It is a more relevant measure, especially when you want to compare countries. If you compare France and China, for instance, well, France has 70 million people, a bit less actually, 67 million people. China now probably has 1.4 billion. Is it 1.4? Maybe a bit more. So you can already expect China to have a higher GDP. However, once you divide the GDP by population, you will find that GDP per capita in France is higher than in China. The idea is that there is more that goes into production than just a couple of workers in a factory. You could have one worker operating some machines so that this worker would be able to produce way more in one hour than 10 workers doing exactly the same thing. This also depends on the type of goods that you are producing. If you are producing mainly uh, manufacturing goods or maybe agricultural goods where you need a lot of labor force, your GDP per capita might be lower than if you are producing very high value added um, goods, like high tech goods, for instance. So one year after um, Christ, here are the GDP shares and the population shares at the same time. Again, remember, those things are estimates. They're based on data that is estimated in the first place. So be careful with those numbers, but they have been thoroughly discussed. They have been um, thoroughly uh, investigated. So probably those are estimates we can um, trust. You can see that India has 33% of the world population and seems to occupy 32% of the world GDP. China 25 for GDP, 26 for population. And you can see that pretty much all those numbers follow each other, more or less, due to the fact that back then, production meant using labor force mostly. There was no such thing as capital, automatized processes, and so on. Europe and today's Western offshoots like US, Canada, Australia were not, were not very populated and they represented less than one fifth of the world population. Here's another graph with cities over 100,000 inhabitants with a bit more years. We have some years, especially green, blue, and red are years after Christ, which are, I believe, a bit more interesting. China and the Middle East are still um, dominating. Okay, Europe is still very small, although in year 1000, their uh, population increased a lot and was as high as the Chinese population.
Yes, 1 AD was 2000, uh, 2020 years ago, to be more precise. So what about trade? Remember, that's kind of the focus of the course, right? So during this, during this stage, Mesopotamia is the hub, okay? Between the Nile and the Indus River Valleys. It is pretty much where everything is happening. But international trade concerns locally unavailable raw materials. Stuff that is not available locally, we're gonna try to get it somewhere else. But because of um, pack animals not being there yet too much, especially over long distances, trade is still pretty small. And it's limited to luxury items. China did not participate in that trade. They were separated by very vast mountains and also deserts, seas, and jungles. Now in stage two, the Silk Road allowed to integrate China to the rest of um, the Middle East and India. So here are a bunch of, uh, there's a, um, a sea route and there is a land route. You can see a bunch of cities, the quality is not great, sorry about that. Uh, a bunch of cities that were uh, on this road and that allowed to um, that allowed to increase trade a bit, yet it was still relatively small and it was mostly exotic goods like spices coming from elsewhere, uh, luxury items and so on. You're not expected to memorize those images. No, don't worry. It is just a history. This lecture is just a history lecture. What you need to know are the main highlights, okay? During phase one or during stage one, who is dominant, why it is dominant, so GDP, share of population, why, and what is the state of trade? Trade is happening, relatively small, for the reasons I mentioned before. But don't worry about the maps. It's just to give you some, um, some uh, um, something visual. So during this phase, the Silk Road, the Silk Road phase, how much trade is happening? It's rather hard to say, but probably not much due to limited transportation technology. You can use camels by land, yeah, but think about how much you can get and how many camels you need to ship some goods from China to Mesopotamia. Think about this rough computation. A kilogram, which is 2.2 pounds of goods per person per week, would require a daily camel train that is 52 kilometers long. So one kilo per person per week would require 52 kilometers long of camels, fully loaded. And you can imagine that probably not all the camels survive the trip. There's also a cost associated to, um, well, keeping the camels alive and maintaining those roads. Politically, what happened? Again, not something to remember uh, in detail, but just get the rough lines. Notable formations are the Roman Empire, took over a big piece of land in um, in the uh, in Europe. The Han Dynasty in China, which I believe most uh, Chinese people are from nowadays, right? Uh, that's what I was told by other international students. Then there was the Golden Age of Islam, until uh, 1250 pretty much. The Mongolian Empire was huge as well. And there were other Chinese dynasties. Oh, sorry about the question marks. It's supposed to be a, um, a dash. Here are the maps. Roman Empire is pretty much taking over um, Europe. Note that I come from here. Aquitania is actually called Aquitaine today. And this is the region I am coming from. 
And in particular, I come from this tiny angle here, this tiny edge. I literally come from the Spanish border. I used to go to Spain every week. It's 30 minutes away from my home by car. And I also want to note that, yes, I'm pretty close to Andorra as well. Andorra is more here in the middle. I am literally by the ocean. Bordeaux is a bit higher. Bordeaux is here. So I am I, back home. I am as close to the mountains and to the beach as we are here in Vancouver. Literally as much. I come from the Vancouver of France, if you like. Yes, I do flex because the people I am coming from, my people, were here before the Romans. We have our own culture. We have our own language that is like none other and that people still have a hard time tracing the origins. It's called the Basque Country. I recommend you to take a look at it on Wikipedia. Beautiful area and uh, another paradise. I do speak it a bit. I have the basics. I'm still learning, but I know, I know words though. Back home, all of the signs to cities are both in French and Basque. I speak Spanish too. It is not similar to anything. That's the beauty of this language. The Romans took over, but the Basques still defended themselves one way or another, uh, especially thanks to the Pyrenees, which is a chain of mountains that goes all the way here. It's not similar to Catalan at all. Nope. Basque and Hungarian are the only two languages in Europe that historians cannot trace the origins yet. Of course, the language changed a lot over time. Um, but it is still, the rules are very, very uh, different from any other language, although they seem to pick from many different languages. Anyway, enough talk about uh, my hometown. I get homesick every now and then, so I like to brag about it. By the way, the Basque people are also the ones who discovered Canada. Yes, yes. We used to fish whales uh, in the Quebec coast back then. So unless Vikings already discovered Canada before the Basques, we are the ones who discovered Canada. Anyway, <laughs> enough about that. The Han Dynasty in China. Uh, I don't know much more about this, unfortunately. Would love to hear about it. But this is pretty much the dynasty, the empire that was um, going on in the east while the Roman Empire was on the west. Then we got the Golden Age of Islam that went all the way to um, Spain, but here got pushed back by um, some people in France. I forgot. There is one Charles Martel that was a uh, <laughs> one of those few events I learned uh, back home um, back home when I was a kid. And the Mongolian Empire, which is gigantic, but that also covers a very big um, desertic area. So, but I believe the Mongolian Empire, in terms of um, territory, was the largest empire ever. Stage three is a bit more interesting. A lot of things are happening between 1350 and 1820. The first thing is the Black Death, the Black Plague, arrived in Europe in 1347. Where did it come from? Supposedly it came from, at least it came from somewhere through the Silk Road. And because of that, the Silk Road was shut down back then. Following the uh, damages of uh, Black Death came this period called Proto-Globalization that I will detail until 1776. So let's go through the Black Death first. This is one of the biggest, if not the biggest disease that ever happened to humanity. It came from the East via the Silk Road and it wiped out between a quarter and a third of Europeans in three years. Even though populations were not high back then, in terms of relative terms, imagine having 25% to 
30% to 33% of the world population today being wiped out. That would be crazy. COVID is not, is nowhere near this level. The interesting about the interesting thing about Black Death is that it transforms European societies in a different way that it transforms the um, Islamic world. It transforms European societies in ways that triggered progress, and this had the opposite effect on the Islamic world. One hypothesis is that is the way those worlds were organized. European societies back then were structured around rural lands governed by nobles, you know, really local castles, local towns, whereas Islamic civilizations had big urban centers where the plague could um, easily hit and transmit. So because of the structure of European societies, Europeans could get back uh, on their feet from the plague, but it really, really hurt Islamic, the Islamic world. Let's look at some estimates. Here are some English population estimates in a million. Okay. Pretty high until beginning of 1300. And then you can see that beginning of after 1320, pretty much, it dramatically um, decreased due to the plague, went back up uh, after the 1400s. In Europe overall, there is a huge decrease beginning of 1300 and the population in Europe starts increasing again after pretty much 1450 uh, or 1500s. Whether we look at two different estimates using different data. You can see that after 1500, the estimates are pretty much the same. I believe that the red curve is the same as the blue curve, whereas before the estimates are a bit different, but the trend is pretty much the same. So three elements triggered the Silk Road shutdown in 1450. The fragmentation of the Islamic world due to uh, the Black Plague, among other things. The fall of Constantinople in 1453 that allowed Ottomans to cut off trade with Europe. So they started isolating themselves from Europe. And the Ming Dynasty in China also isolated itself. China flourished in the centuries with a lot of arts, science, many inventions. And they decided to stop exploration efforts after several voyages, several trips of um, Admiral Zhang He. This led to this period called proto-globalization. The shutdown of the Silk Road and the Black Plague launched this kind of preparatory stage for the shift that was to come in phase two. That's what Anthony Hopkins, not the actor, although maybe he's both actor and historian, probably not, calls proto-globalization. It is a preparatory stage. There are three main um, pillars in this, um, in this era. Renaissance, Reformation and Enlightenment. Stuff that happened, you know, in Italy and France back then with a lot of arts, Leonardo da Vinci, um, inventions, Copernicus, and so on and so forth. Then the age of discovery with a lot of explorations, discovering the Americas, for instance, or in particular, but also um, Africa. And finally, the Columbian Exchange. So first, Renaissance. It's likely that some of you have never studied this period. 
I have studied this period every year for easily 10 years because one of the birthplaces of Renaissance is France. So I had to study this over and over again. It was nice at the beginning, became painful eventually. So I won't ask you to know too much about this because I don't want to uh, know too much about this either. But it's a period of flourishing ideas and arts. There is the birth of humanism, Michelangelo, Galileo, Luther, Da Vinci, Copernicus. Um, there is also the um, shift between geocentrism and heliocentrism. Remember, geocentrism was this idea, this ideology that everything was revolving around the Earth. So when they found out that the Earth was round, I mean, we still don't know. <laughs> there are still some flat Earther out there. So when they realized or when they started believing that the Earth was round, um, the main ideology was that everything was revolving around the Earth, that the sun and the moon and whatever else they could observe was revolving, was revolving around the Earth. Eventually, this uh, ideology shifted to heliocentrism. Helio means the sun in Greek. Helios, I believe, is a Greek. Is it a Greek god? Something like that. Um, where they realize that everything revolves around the sun instead. It's also a big shift in um, the way humanity is perceived. At the beginning, humanity thought, oh, everything is revolving around us. We are, huma we are the most important thing in the world. That's, that's pretty much what they meant by the moon, the sun, and everything else is re are revolving around us. And then that moved to, oh, we are revolving around something else. So we are actually a satellite for another celestial corp corpse. That is a shift. That it's, it's the beginning of being humbled, pretty much. Okay? Yes, Jarrell, you're pretty much, that's pretty much it. Yes, you're right. You should be able to locate, you should be, you should be able to date Renaissance period and say, vaguely what happened, but you can you can stay vague. I won't ask you to name really guys in particular. Okay, so it's really in this lecture, I will ask you to remember the big ideas, just to understand what the process uh, that led to 1820, the first unbundling is. After the first unbundling, then we're going to have to, I'm going to require you guys to know a bit more. The Reformation marks the start of Protestantism, which is huge in, which got huge in Europe and, well, it's the leading um, religion in North America. You know, most people who tell you they are Christians, in fact, what they should say is that they are Protestants, because Catholicism is also part of Christianity. I was born and raised Catholic. I am not a Catholic at all anymore. So, we could, I could also say I am Christian. I was born and raised Christian. But it doesn't mean the same as a Christian here. So when people say Christian, they usually mean Protestant or any other subfield like Baptist, Anglican. Those are also part of um, Christianity. Protestantism is the um, dominating one, though. The invention of printing happened back then with Gutenberg, who invented printing. And so that was a great way for religions to spread by printing more and more copies of their texts. That's a very good question. Is it morally right to switch religions during life? Um, I don't know. <laughs> but I didn't switch. <laughs> I ran away. <laughs> but that's an interesting question. And then after Renaissance and Reformation, Enlightenment um, came with a lot of a lot of authors, in particular literature and philosophers, which furthered the rights of Europe. A couple of those names: um, René Descartes, Locke, Voltaire, French guy, Newton. Pretty pretty sick at math. Newton is the guy who invented calculus. So 
you guys are going to have to do calculus at some point, probably in your degree, whether it's in math, stats, or economics. Newton was the one who invented it. Hobbes is a philosopher. Kant is a philosopher that very hard to read, but you can try. Rousseau is another one. Same. Don't. I won't ask you to um, ask. I won't ask you to remember all of the big names, because I had to study each of those names in high school, and literally each of them. Uh, maybe not Hobbes, but I know all of the other ones. That was pretty painful. We are here to talk about economics. There won't be any calculus in this course. No, because you're going to learn calculus in a math course and do it later in Econ 201, for instance. Why Europe? How come all of these things happened in Europe? So in Europe back then was also the birth of capitalism. For those of you who don't know exactly what the definition of capitalism is, it's very important and it's misused in this day and age. Capitalism is pretty much just gathering means of productions under one roof. So literally capitalism started with windmills. People wanted to make some wheat, to produce some wheat, but it was pretty costly to operate a whole mill on your own. So basically, some people started to gather their money. Okay, so they capitalize. Capitalize is this idea of gathering, of accumulating, in order to um, sustain production. So this is very different from liberalism or uh, whatever people talk about today when they talk about competition. Oh, capitalism is the fault of capitalism, why um, civilizations are collapsing and whatnot. Not exactly. Capitalism is just one other uh, way to organize production. That's literally what it is. Okay? It's not good, not bad. It can be used in a good way. It can be used in a bad way, sure. But the concept itself, there's nothing wrong about it. Nor there is anything right, don't get me wrong. And all of those philosophers, science, um, who made scientific inventions, have occurred in Europe. So this allowed Europe to rise after the Black Plague. And this is also a change in the mindset. Instead of assuming we know what's going on out there, now it is more like, huh, we are not sure about what's going on out there, so let's find out. Let's figure it out. So it's also a um, the, a um, growing curiosity for the rest of the world instead of assuming that um, they already knew what was going on. Capitalism is just one way to organize production, if you like. Private sector just says you own your own thing. And actually, you make an interesting point. The idea of capitalism is some people gather to organize production in a certain way, so they own the means of production. They own whatever they put in. I put some money in, so I own some shares of the company. That's what a shareholder is. Or I'm the one who brought some material to build the, the windmill or I brought the machines. So I own some means of production. And because of that, I am entitled to receive some profits earned from the production of what I own. Now, the definition of property, who owns what, is actually older than capitalism. Think about all those empires who would claim territories and then they would maybe give some territories to some of their nobles, some of their uh, generals in the army. That is a more interesting topic to look at if you want to talk about the, uh, the capitalism in this day and age. The definition of property and how property is allocated would be a more uh, relevant concept than talking about capitalism. But that's going to be for another class, another time. Then came the age of discovery. Since the road to the east was shut down, 
Europeans decided to go to the West. What's on the West? The Atlantic Ocean. So let's figure out if there is anything that ends there. And there was also another way to reach the East. Remember, Christopher Columbus, when he found the Americas, thought he landed in India. And this is why we still talk about Indian Americans. He thought, oh, I went around the globe. I reached India. No, there was something on the way. The Portuguese, um, you might not know about this, but the Portuguese um, crown played a big role in uh, all those discoveries. They financed a series of trips to find an access to Asia around Africa. So going all the way down, going uh, past by South America, um, past by South Africa to reach um, to reach Asia. But some winds, you know, currents and winds got them, <laughs> made them drift pretty much away to South America, and. You can now imagine why Brazil is a Portuguese-speaking country. That was because the Portuguese crown back then took the initiative of discovering, uh, discovered that part of the Americas trying to go around Africa. In 1492, Columbus discovers America. I hope you remember that date at least. It's a pretty big one. Through the West. Portugal claims Brazil at the beginning of 1500s. And I believe Portugal is, I believe Brazil is the only country, maybe there's one or two more, maybe Suriname. Uh, no, not Suriname. I forgot the other one. That uh, only countries in South America that speaks Portuguese as a national um, language, as an official language. Yes, Suriname speaks Dutch. Yeah, thank you. I was thinking about that. The Dutch did a lot as well. And so other countries took part in this King of the Hills game. The Netherlands, so the Dutch. The UK, of course. Spain, a lot. France, so Spain was mostly in South America with the rest, um, the rest of the other countries and Latin America. They were also pretty active in the United States along with the French and the British. But it seems that uh, the British are the ones who kind of won since uh, it's an English speaking country to this day. Fun fact, if you are looking at the dollar, just type dollar, American dollar online, the world dollar, the word dollar comes from um, a Spanish word. And the sign, the dollar sign, S with two bars, also has some Spanish history. You can take a look at it. It dates back to trade that was happening back then. And um, this is where the name dollar came from, interestingly. Although the currency in Spain was the peso or the pesetas. So that's an interesting history fact. The French were pretty influential in Africa. That's why many African countries to this day um, speak French. Um, officially, I can think about um, Ivory Coast, Cameroon, Congo at some point, but maybe not anymore. Um, Angola is one of them. I believe Rwanda had a, had a or maybe has now a still has a French um, a French speaking part. Um, Ethiopia might be one of them. Madagascar. Um, yeah, and a couple of other ones. The Dutch were very influential as well. Did not impose their language too much. Like, yeah, Suriname would be maybe the only other country that speaks Dutch as an official language. But another fun fact, they were... Ah, thank you for uh, Congo and Rwanda. That's what I was uh, thinking of. Yes, of course, Morocco, uh, North Africa, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. Very strong history with France. Another fun fact, um, so you know tea has two words. You can either say tea or cha, depending on the countries. The word tea is due to the Netherlands because they were the ones who were trading tea in particular back then. And I believe this is the word they were using 
when they were trading with Asia. They used to call it T, which actually is the way to pronounce it in French. And this became T or T in uh, many countries in the world and stayed Cha in many other ones. And the third one was the Columbian Exchange. So after the age of discovery came the time to trade and use all the ships to trade. So the old world, Europe, had a couple of things to bring to the new world. In terms of agriculture, they had wheat, sugar, rice, coffee, horses, cows, pig, pigs for cattle. But they also had a bunch of diseases. Those mean Europeans. And those diseases were diseases that the new world was not used to. So those diseases wiped out a huge part of the population in the Americas in general. The new world had a lot of gold and silver, tobacco, corn, maize, potatoes, pineapples, Central, uh, Central America, tomatoes, vanilla, and chocolate. They had apparently syphilis, yeah. So, yeah, it's pretty mean, right? The old world showed up. First of all, they wiped out some of the population to impose themselves, to impose their culture, to um, extract any resources that the locals would not agree to or force them, you know? Trade was a very uh, vague concept back then. It was not necessarily consensual, okay? And on top of that, they brought a bunch of um, diseases that... Uh, they did not even try to treat the local population, really. What countries are included in the New World versus the Old World? Um, so, oh, sorry about that. The Old World would be mainly the European countries who went to the Americas. So, it would be Netherlands. UK, Spain, Portugal, France, um, who else can I think of? I don't even know if Belgium was a thing back then, but I don't think these guys were ever too, uh, too bellicous, too imperialist. The, the new world would be all the countries in the Americas. So what we today call the US, Canada, Latin, uh, Latin American countries, so there would be uh, Mexican, Uruguay, Paraguay, uh, Brazil, Chile, Peru, um, Suriname, what else can I think of? Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Ecuador, everything in Central America as well. Yeah. And by importing crops from the Americas, so in particular potato and maize, there was a huge rise in population density in Europe. So that further increased the European population. You can see a sharp... Uh, here, you can see a sharp increase in uh, Western European population after the discoveries. Whereas populations decreased quite a lot in US, Peru, in, uh, US, Peru and Mexico. And then they increased a bit again. In exchange, the new world received new diseases, which explains a yeah this massive um, depopulation. So now I've been talking about Europe a lot. Let's compare. What, uh, well, let's compare how Europe was doing versus Asia. So this proto-globalization period allowed income to rise in Europe. And the Industrial Revolution began. With all those flourishing ideas came flourishing innovations. You start with new abstract ideas like mathematical concepts, and then you start applying them. And there was... Um, the development of mechanical engineering, for instance. 
using all those mathematical concepts of forces, uh, physics, not very well versed in all those things, but apply them to real world, um, real world um, mechanics, which allowed the industrial revolution to begin. At the beginning, it was mostly limited to Britain. Why? Because those French, again, were uh, delayed the spread of, uh, delayed the industrial revolution because of wars. We very often talk about French Revolution. Many, many people talk about this, about, you know, freedom of, you know, freedom of, of rights and, and so on. Um, the interesting fact is that roughly 15 years after the French Revolution, France got an empire. And France started waging war to other countries. An empire with a sacred, with a sacred emperor. The emperor was sacred by the Pope. So, you know, you can talk about um, freeing people, freeing them from their rights and so on, but 15 years later, back to an empire, that's not very glorious. This empire was particularly successful at waging wars with other countries, led by Napoleon. He was probably overcompensating a lot because Napoleon was known for being a very, very short person by the, back then. He was pretty short. So maybe he was overcompensating and wanted to just dominate Europe. But because of um, all of those wars, industrial revolution could not begin on the main continent and stay limited to Britain. Oh, was he? Average height? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. You have a good point. Everybody was short, so he was not shorter than the others. True. I don't know what he was overcompensating for then. <laughs> but definitely, this guy had very, very uh, big ambitions. Got stopped in um, 1815. So, if you look at population over time and output in terms of shares of population and output, India and China were pretty much dominating. But then Europe had some um, uh, progress going on. However, population is still relatively low in Europe as opposed to India and China. So in terms of world GDP share, Asia still dominates. Ah, Louis XIV was the one really short. Thank you very much. You guys know more about French history than I do. <laughs> That's nice to see. <laughs> now, let's go back to um, GDP again. So I talked about GDP, GDP growth, GDP per capita, which was a way to compare incomes across countries. Now, let's look at what we call real GDP versus nominal GDP. GDP is a market value. So it is measured in dollars. You take all of the goods that were produced, multiply them by their respective price, and you take the sum in the whole country to compute GDP one year. Dollars, any currency, but usually we use dollars because it's the, it's the uh, biggest currency in the world. This is a way to compare countries with each other. Now, when you think about GDP growth, you might think between one year and another, production could have increased instead of um, one unit of the good, two units were made. Okay, so GDP would increase by 100%. It will double. However, since we are looking at the market value, we would look at the market value the year before. So using the prices the year before, the first year that good was worth $5. But if the price of that good changes over time, that might trick, trick us in thinking that GDP increased more than it actually did. When we talk about GDP, we care about quantities. 
We don't care about prices. So if between two years, the price of a given good increased, that would increase GDP even more than we think. So we need to abstract from that change in prices. We need to neutralize the effect of a change in price. We don't care if there was inflation. What we care about is just in terms of quantities, how much more was produced. So what we call a real value in general, GDP, wage, anything, anything that is measured in dollars, but that we call real, is equal to a nominal value, the original value in dollars, divided by some sort of a price. So the real GDP will be nominal GDP divided by the consumer price index, CPI. The consumer price index is a measure of uh, prices in the economy at a given period of time. So there are so many goods in an economy that it's pretty hard to tr keep track of all of them. The way we do is we build a representative basket of goods and attach some sort of a price to each of those goods in this basket. We can create some sort of an average and we can say a representative basket in 2020 costs this much. In 2021, the same basket costs this much. If the cost increased, then there was inflation. There was an increase in uh, the consumer price index. And that's usually what we call inflation as a whole. That's how we compute inflation. Increase or decrease in consumer price index. By dividing GDP by the consumer price index, we get rid of the effect of a change in prices. And the only thing that we can, the only thing that we are comparing now is quantity produced in 2020 versus quantity produced in 2019. Inflation is not an indicator of how good a country is doing. If prices increase for whatever reason, it could be short shortage uh, of supply, it could be increase in the costs, it could be um, monetary inflation. This is not an indicator of how well a country is doing. Instead, looking at the change in quantities is telling us, oh, people have access to higher quantities today than they had tomorrow, than they had yesterday. And we assume usually that the more you can consume, the happier you are. It's a shortcut, but it is one measure among others. Real GDP can be computed in many different ways, or at, at least GDP. We can compute it the, the following way. Compensation of employees, so you, com you sum up all the wages of everybody during one year using everybody's receipts. Pretty much firms have to declare to their using their accounting, using their accountant, have to declare to the government how much wages they paid every month or every two weeks. Plus interest being paid, plus royalty income, plus dividends. So any source of income added up will make national income. And in fact, that's not something you need to know by heart, but you will see this in other classes. This is also a uh, good formula for GDP. Now, to compute the uh, dividend, sorry, sorry about that, I'm skipping a lot of words here. Uh, dividend is money paid to shareholders. So if you own um, stocks, at the end of the year, if the company decides to um, redistribute some of their profits in the form of dividends, you are going to get some money. That will be a dividend. So dividend, when you think about dividend, think about stocks. Not only your stocks uh, can increase in value or decrease, so you can resell them and so on, but if you keep them for a sufficient amount of time, depending on which stock you're looking at, but 
you will also receive a dividend from the firm. You won't need to use the formulas, but you need to know broadly what they are. I won't ask you exactly what they are, but you need to know broadly what they are. Yes, if you have a share of a company, depending on what type of share, there are many different types of stocks that exist. But if you have a stock that gives you a dividend, yes, at the end of the year, the uh, company is going to have this annual meeting where you might be invited, usually at least big shareholders are invited and you can uh, they decide what to do with the extra profits they might decide to redistribute some of them in the form of dividends up to how many stocks you own from the company they might decide to reinvest this money in something else buying a new warehouse produce more i don't know opening a new market or they might need to they might want to use these profits in other ways like maybe pay increase uh, the wages of their employees or reinvesting in their um, production capacities, buying new machines. A bank stock, careful, because when uh, banks don't issue stocks, they issue bonds. A bond is a bit different. A bond is works like a stock but a bond, you will receive interest no matter what you do. If you buy a bond from a bank or from the central bank or from anyone else, whoever issued this bond has to pay you at the end of the year. Yes, you can, yeah, you do, you can, share, you can get share of banks. You're right, sorry. But you can also buy shares of Apple if you want. If you go, to, if you go online, you can buy shares for Netflix. But you can also buy shares uh, from banks. You're right, you're right. A bond is a bit different. A bond entitles you to receive money no matter what. It says, you pay this much, $100, $100 bond. And at the end of the year, I guarantee you, you're going to get 1% on it. And when it says guarantees, it means it's going to be paid no matter what. There is no risk. With a stock, there is risk. If the stock price decreases and so on, the firm might not decide to give you any dividend. So nothing says that you're going to make any money out of a stock. Bonds and shares are different. One of them is riskless. The other one is risky. That's usually the trade-off between the two. The riskless one has a low interest, usually a low return. The risky ones can have a high return, but can also have a low return. Now, talking about income per, um, per capita, real income per capita, leads you, leads us to what we call the Malthusian trap. So Thomas Robert Malthus had this theory that income per capita increases due to technological advances, you know, better production processes, better learning by doing, so being more efficient at what you do because you've been doing it for um, weeks, months, years. But inevitably are due or lost due to a uh, subsequent population growth. So the idea is that an innovation could increase productivity. So you can increase production for the same amount of people working. Because a new machine, let's say a new innovation, allows you to produce twice as much. This increase in production is going to increase health, longevity, quality of life, and population as well. If you know you can feed more people, you might decide to raise kids, for, for instance, who have more kids. But once this population increases, once uh, people die later, once you realize you need to feed all of those new people or all of those older people, then eventually you will go back to the same uh, level of subsistence as before. That's his argument. The idea is that you can keep innovating, but the growth in population will follow, or at least the growth in uh, longevity, quality of life will grow. 
so that all of those gains in food will go to all the people or um, new populations so that the economy will be back to its subsistence level, the same level of income per capita as before. He called this a trap by saying that, you know, no matter how much you push the innovation, you will always go back to the initial level. That's pretty much his argument, which can be challenged in many different ways. But that's a um, good one to um, think about. Real GDP ma makes more sense than nominal GDP. That's not what he is saying. Real GDP makes more sense in terms of comparison, that's all. It's misleading to compare nominal GDPs from one year to another, because part of the increase can be due to just increase in prices. Real GDP is what you need to look at. So it is possible that birth rates decline, but the idea is that if an innovation allows you to produce more food, you should be able to increase health, increase longevity, and increase natality. And so birth rates would actually increase and get positive eventually. Per capita is always more interesting because it's a way to compare two countries. Within one country, you prefer to look at real GDP over time, 2020 versus 2019, real GDP. Nominal, we don't care. If you want to compare two countries, let's say France and China, to have a different orders of magnitude, then it is meaningless to look at just real GDP. Of course, Chinese real GDP will be way higher, way higher. It's more than, yeah, way higher. GDP per capita is a measure of, on average, how much income goes to each inhabitant of a country. This is more um, relevant if you want to compare two countries, two territories with different populations. Now, I see in the chat as well that there is this idea of carrying capacity of a given country. You're right. The idea of the Malthusian trap is that you can increase innovation, increase food and so on, but at the end of the day, you will always go back to your subsistence level. One of the problems is doubling food, especially food, usually means taking more space. And so there's this idea that eventually the country is going to reach a certain capacity and go back to its subsistence level once the population catches up, once longevity catches up. Well, if there is a problem of overpopulation, again, it just means that there won't be enough uh, food to feed everybody, right? So eventually, population will also decrease. It's sad to hear, but the idea of uh, Malthus is that no matter how far an innovation gets you, you will go back to your subsistence level. The interesting thing about um, that concept is that it does not take into account international trade. If a country reaches capacity, oh, I can feed everybody in my country and there is no land for me to use anymore. Let's open the borders. Let's see what's out there. Or let's take over a new territory. I'm not sure China would be an example of that effect because I don't really know uh, much about how much um, land is used in China. Um, I know that in very rural China, agriculture is still fairly, fairly uh, rudimentary. It's not uh, using top-notch technology, so there might still be improvement there to increase yields. Um, for the rest, I'm still not sure. I know that the development in China is really uh, goes at different speeds, depending on where in China um, you are looking at. 
So the population is trapped into a subsistence level of life. That's the, the famous Malthusian trap. If you look um, deeper into it, there are um, arguments against this theory. Again, this theory was, this argument was made in the 1700s or 1800s. So you can imagine that there are many loopholes that uh, can be exploited. So let's look at per capita income until the first unbundling, 1820. Again, those are estimates. And for the longest time, income per capita was pretty much at its minimum level of subsistence for many, many countries. A bit above for uh, Middle East and Eastern European countries, think about Greece, um, Iraq, Iran, Egypt, um, but overall, most countries were stuck at the minimum level of subsistence. The idea was also that back then, innovations were not good enough to increase value added by uh, that much. Later though, 1500s, 1600s, it increased a lot in some countries, in particular European countries. Italy here, Portugal, Spain, France, Germany, UK, Netherlands, US and Canada later, because it took time to, uh, you know, to ship all this technology and to settle and to start producing, to start uh, creating an economy in those countries. And you can see that all of those uh, Middle East countries slash Asian countries were still around the minimum level of um, subsistence. So let's summarize phase one and phase two. Phase one, we have local um, formations of hunter gatherers. They go where they see animals they can kill and eat, and eat. They go where they can find some things to eat. Once the area is depleted, they move to the next area. So consumption moves to production. You can think of wild animals and fruits and wild fruits as being the production. Consumers go to where the food is. In phase two, Agricultural revolution allows production to move to consumption. You can settle locally in an area that, that uh, is fertile, grow some crops, make some food, and eventually bring it to the people. That will also mark the beginning of civilizations. Those civilizations develop around fertile areas because this is where food can be made relatively easily because of the seasons, the floods, and so on. Sorry, let me go back to uh, per capita income. I see in the chat a question. Yes, that's what Malthus predicts. He predicts that even though you see spikes due to innovations and whatnot, Eventually, the increase in, um, in food production will lead to an increase in population, longevity, quality of life. So all this food will then be used to feed uh, um, more people. And so once you divide the new income that was very high by the new population, which, is, which has increased as a consequence, you go back to the same ratio. Typically, think of it as GDP is equal to 10 and population is equal to 10. So GDP per capita would be equal to one. You can think of 10 loaves of bread is GDP divided by 10 people. So one person, uh, one, uh, yeah, one person gets one loaf of bread each. That's the beginning. And imagine this is minimum subsistence level. One loaf of bread per day, you can survive with that. 
You won't be very healthy, but you can survive. Imagine now, there is innovation. Windmills, you can produce wheat in a better quantity, in a higher quantity, or yields are better for one reason or another. Easier to make flour. Now in one day, instead of producing 10 loaves, you can produce 20 loaves. So now, you get two loaves per person. 20 divided by 10. That's the consequence of innovation. But now that you have more food than you need, population, maybe, is going to start increasing. Either they can live longer, or they can, make, for example, make kids. And the idea is that the population is going to adjust until all of this extra food is being used up. So, you get population that increases until, let's say, 30. Imagine, increases more than, more than expected. Well, some people won't get food, they will die, and they will come back to 20 people. 20 loaves of bread for 20 people, 20 divided by 20 is equal to 1. Again, 1 loaf of bread per person. And so, his idea of a trap is that there might be an adjustment of population. Population might increase too much, overpopulation. But then, if there's not enough food, population is going to die until there is enough food to feed all those people. If population is lower, you have extra food you can use to feed extra people. And so population will increase. And so his idea is that every time income increases due to innovations, population with, will consequently increase so that the ratio will always be the same, one loaf of bread per person. So, going back to the summary. Phase one, hunter-gatherers move to locations to feed themselves. Trade is very rare, and it's mostly some tools like obsidian some kind of volcanic glass. Phase two, due to the agricultural evolution, civilizations develop, expand around fertile areas and um, long growing seasons area, areas. In particular, it starts with the rise of Asia. Populations concentrate around those river valleys that Asia is endowed with, and I am counting Middle East here as well with the Nile and Indus valleys. Then, Asia integrates, integrates with Europe through the Silk Road that allows some trade of spices and so on, but it's relatively small. It's mostly luxury goods, so it's mostly rich people who want to get some exotic things from um, abroad. Black Death shows up in 1350 and penetrates Europe through the Silk Road. So, as a consequence, the Silk Road is shut down, Asia separates from Europe again. The Black Death, however, has a good consequence on Europe in terms of pushing ideas, trying to develop cures, health, humanism, ideas, arts, discoveries, and so on while it has dramatic impacts on the Islamic world because of the way it is organized. There is a lot of uh, Silk Road um, trade, you're right, but relative to the population, not that much. In absolute terms, yes, there is. But if you compare to the number of inhabitants in Europe and in Asia back then, it's still relatively small. And what matters here is relatively small. So, in this pre-industrial revolution area, the main takeaway is consumption and production are bundled. Where things are produced, they are consumed. Even in phase two with agriculture, they don't ship agricultural products throughout the whole country. It's locally consumed. They can ship it to local towns. So production moves to consumption, but it doesn't move very far. 
international trade happens in relatively low volume. Luxury good, like, like silk, spices, glassware, and raw materials that are not available locally, like wood or tin, to make tools. Because of that, although populations increased during the agriculture, agricultural revolution, per income capita did not really change that much. So the consequence of, well, not much happening, if you like, is the following graph. This is the graph that I talked about last week, and this is the graph that is going to uh, uh, be our main, uh, our main anchor for the first half of the semester, until the reading break. The um, GDP share estimates between G7 countries and China plus India over the years are fairly constant. If you just draw a trend here, a line, it's pretty much horizontal. And if you look at Europe, it's maybe slightly increasing, but it's not, it's not crazy. They are at a bit less than 10 and they go to 20 eventually, but really they go to 20 at the very end. In China and India, it fluctuates a bit more. So what happens here is, in these first, first two phases, is a great stagnation. Remember here, we talk about stagnation, divergence, and convergence of GDP world shares. China and India pretty much occupy 50% of world GDP back then. And it's mostly due to their high population, not to their high innovations or value added. Populations in Europe increase from 1480 on, in particular thanks to the Columbian Exchange, to get more food and allow, um, and allow population to increase even more. It decreased before because of um, the Black Plague, that would be in this area, and increased again after the Age of Discovery. Up to 1820, if you look at the graph, it's pretty much the same, same. What's interesting, however, is what happens after. Between 1820 and 1990 is what we call the first unbundling. And you can see there's a bunch of dots. First of all, because it was easier to estimate, data started being gathered and collected back then. And you can see that there's a huge reversal of the trend. The share of world GDP decreased dramatically in Asia and increased sharply for European countries up to pretty much 1990. What happened then? The second unbundling. The second unbundling made the GDP world, the world GDP share of European countries decrease again, while, while the world share of GDP of China and India started increasing again. So we have those three phases. Great stagnation, until the first unbundling, great divergence, they really go in the opposite direction and their share of GDP really, the difference increases over time. And after 1990, they are getting closer and closer again, the great convergence. Hence the name of the book. So overall, we can talk about a great convergence because we're looking at year 1000 and year 2017 or something. But in between, this great convergence process is broken down into three different phases. The great stagnation is what we went over. The great divergence is what we are going to talk about next week and in two weeks. And finally, the great convergence after 1990.
Here I am looking at uh, just world share of world GDP. I'm not sure what you mean by looking at just real GDP because it would be the same thing. Real GDP in China and India would be, uh, if this is 10% and this is 50%, then it would be 40% higher. Green dots are the world shares of GDP for G7 countries, so European countries. I believe it includes um, Spain, UK, France, maybe Portugal back then, Italy, who is missing? Netherlands, maybe another one. You're right. The share, the, the, the GDP, the GDP of countries have ne has never been decreasing in any country in the world. In China and India, GDP also increases. It increases faster than in G7 countries. The idea is to look at who occupies what share of the pie. So every year, world GDP increases. Forget about the pandemic. So the pie, the size of the pie, is getting bigger and bigger. But who gets what share, who gets what slice, is what changed over time. If you want to look at the breakdown per country, you can probably find this data online. Um, World Bank has great data. Um, Google has something called Google uh, Public Data. They might have a couple of numbers like that. I just don't have this graph in this class, per country. The idea is to oppose those two different areas because we observe these sharp differences, these sharp uh, changes in trends over time. Uh, in this graph, I think Japan is counted as G7, yes. I think it is. Just for the longest time, it did not account for much. But definitely after 1990 or after 1920 as well, definitely it played a big role. Yes, I think I think um, I think it is part of the G7 countries. Canada is in there, yes, but since Canada started being Canada only 155 years old, uh, years ago, uh, you know, Canada is not really part of it for the longest time. That's what I mean. No. Here, we don't talk about the size. We talk about who gets what slice of the pie. So, population increased over time. So, the size of the pie increased the whole time. It's who gets what share that stayed constant for, for a long time. That's what we have in this graph. That's all. But this is what's important here. We are not going to compare which country is faster at growing because the argument is that, well, the more a country grows, the less it should be growing the year after that. There is this idea of decreasing returns to growth, which is why Western countries, the wealthiest countries in the world, have the lowest growth rates, whereas developing countries have higher growth rates. They're not as rich as developed countries, but they're growing higher. Think about being an expert in a sport. When you already are an expert, you don't make progress day by day. You have to work very hard to make progress. But when you're a beginner, having two or three sessions is already going to increase your level by a lot. That's the idea. So if the beginner works sufficiently hard, he should be able to catch up to the expert eventually. Well. That's not counting for other factors, but that's uh, the, the narrative. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well then. That's it for um, this lecture. 
Next week and in two weeks, we are going to go through the first unbundling. So it will take two weeks to go over this 150-ish years. But it took us only one lecture to go through 10,000 years. Way more things are going to happen after 1820. That's it for this lecture. Have a good rest of your week. And see you in the next one. Bye.